I'm just so excited that this day has come and uh, we're having this symposium. And truly, really what I want to get out of, out of today is really an understanding about how you in the audience and the audience beyond are thinking and feeling about the future of food policy. And to do that, we need to look back. We need to think about where our successes have been, where we've made a difference, where we haven't made a difference. And somebody who has made a huge difference is my predecessor, Professor Tim Lang, who I'm delighted is still with us at the centre, but has stepped back from leading it. It's with immense pride that I have taken on uh, his position. And, um, and certainly, there's a lot of work to do, but wow, uh, what, a, what, a lot of, what a great basis we've got for, for building on. So it's with great pleasure that I asked Tim to open up this symposium with a reflection on how far we have come, what we've learned, what we can do better into the future um, over the, um, and focusing on the past uh, 25 years. Uh, for those of you who don't know him, Professor Tim Lang was the director of the center before me. And uh, by the end of this talk, you will know him well. He gives such great talks. Tim. <laughs> Am I mic'd up? Can you hear? They can nod. I've got out of my bed. I've been in bed with flu, so I'm looking at you in the total fog. Uh, but uh, as my family says, actually, I'm nicer then. <laughs> <coughs> Excuse me. I'll probably cough and splutter, but don't worry, I'm all right. Um, well, thank you, Corinna. Um, actually, this is a double pleasure for me although I've dragged myself out of bed, um, because I haven't had to organize this. <laughs> so uh, I've been the hand holder, metaphorically, for Corinna. She's not, not panicked, but sort of pulling these things together, which I've done uh, always <coughs> till now, is actually a lot of work. Um, and what we've always tried to do is um, make this a very convivial occasion, but also a very thoughtful occasion. And just to remind you, last one we had was on Brexit. and. Uh, I don't think Corinna was alone in thinking Tim was completely off his rocker in making the uh, um, symposium last year about Brexit because everyone knew it wouldn't happen. Well, it did, or the vote happened. And all that we did this time last year actually has been incredibly useful and has repositioned um, the centre as a tiny organisation. Actually, I'm now working full-time for Corinna only paid one day a week on Brexit, uh, and entirely because of what we did last year. But I'm not going to talk about that. Um, I'm firstly just really want to thank everyone who's here, um, and I want to thank people that you won't know. Obviously, you know Corinna, but I really want to thank Corinna very much. She's been wonderful. Um, I want to thank my colleagues in the centre. Uh, you know, lots are here. Um, David and Martin particularly, my lovely colleagues. I go cheerful. It's the sentimental one in me. <laughs> we always used to joke that we, uh, we, we worked together longer than we'd been with our wives. Uh, <laughs> uh, and I think it was actually very nice because we, we, we've argued, we've worked together despite it all, we've done things. And it's been fantastic. Uh, I want to thank Lord Ashburton, who none of you will know. Anyone know Lord Ashburton? Well, he <coughs> headed the Barings Bank, and Barings Bank, Barings Foundation gave me the funding for my job, allowed me to have the space for three years' funding. Uh, and actually, I wrote to him to thank him very much for it when I stood down. Because um, even though Barings Bank went into liquidation, uh, the foundation honoured its pledge to support me in starting this. So we wouldn't be here, actually, without a banking toff, basically, the oldest bank in Britain. Um, Julius Weinberg, Roland Petschy, David Reindorf, former VC, all these people. I just want to really thank uh, and place it. My colleagues from sociology, my lovely head of department, Chris Greer, is here in sociology, the school you've just had, uh, Theo, and the previous school in health sciences, uh, and my friends, really. Um, I've campaigned with, <coughs> excuse me, some are dead, Caroline Walker, Aubrey Sheehan last year, 
really terrible. Uh, but there's a little theme in this that, uh, you know, we all die. Um, but uh, these things are important to build into movements and traditions of thinking that people come and go, but the tradition carries on. And Aubrey and Caroline were real movement people in that sense. Um, so I want to also thank our students who've been a constant source of joy uh, and hard work, but above all, my wife and his. Okay, I'm going to reflect on the center very briefly. I don't want to be, <coughs> excuse me, I don't want to go into this too much. Um, but basically, I think um, we, what we've done in the center has been all teamwork. You can't do these things, even though nice things were said by Corinna and uh, Theo about me. Um, these things are all collective efforts. Nothing ever gets done by single people. Don't believe anyone who says they're heroes or heroines. It's not like that. Um, uh, it's teamwork with us. Um, but it's also having some guts to focus on particular arguments and particular issues. And I think we set out, for, to you, the centre is actually 23-year-old, Years, uh, years old next March, but for me it's 25 years ago because it took two years to get the funding to get my place and so on. Um, uh, and basically the, the goal was very clear actually to try and modernize academic understanding of food policy and to develop what I think we've tried to do which is a, a, a complex understanding of multi-sector, multi-actor, multi-level food policy, starting with food policy through a systems lens. And I think we've tried to do that. Where we've been quite radical is in questioning the mantra in public policy that uh, the goal is evidence-based policy. We have gently said that that's not good enough. Now, evidence-based medicine is fine, uh, but evidence-based policy is trickier. It's always bigger and more complicated. And indeed, events don't change unless you have campaigns and you have shifts of the political context which enable the evidence to change. So I think that's one of the things that we've done very effectively. I'm just getting very woolly. I'm just going to have some water. Um, What we did was essentially to split the, um, the old view of food policy and stop doing the top-down approach, thank you, um, the top-down approach and start taking a lateral approach to food. Thanks very much, Corinne. I suddenly went all weedy. Um, uh, I mean, we basically tried to... Um, set up the Food Policy Centre to help civil society while developing the academic arguments and the data and to tease out the realities of evidence and policy and to look at the realities of public policy and were they really as neat as just applying the medical model to it. And I think after 25 years we've concluded no, it doesn't quite work in that same way. It's wrong to say we want policies with no evidence. We're not saying that. We're saying that uh, the relationship between evidence and policy and practice is more complicated than just a linear um, connection. Uh, why the Food Policy Centre was set up was to try to develop this sort of understanding, to look at problems in for the world of food and say, what's the role of policymakers? What's the role of policy advocacy? What changes policy such that the circumstances can improve? Uh, I sat, before I had flu, two weeks ago preparing this and thought, right, I'll try to really summarize, not in sort of anyone's read my very boring academic work. It's sort of tedious and long. Um, what if I had to say it in three minutes? So I'm going to give you the three-minute version. I think things that we've done well in the last 25 years. I think we've got issues on the agenda, food poverty, we've got 
there's Darwin and lots of other people, you have Tanzi, great people, doughty fighters in that within academia and civil society. We've got cooking skills, Martin, uh, me a little bit at the beginning on that. We've looked at the underbelly of globalization. We've looked at poor nutrition, Corinna's doyen of this. We've tried to look at the relationship between data and models. Mike Rayner is here, always very good on these sort of things, looking at the modeling of these things. We've realized and pushed the argument of the need for cross-disciplinary networks and frameworks, multi-criteria approaches rather than single-criteria approaches. And we've had some success in getting issues translated into real policy shifts. I think nutrition standards took a long time. 45 years ago, they were taken away. Mm, sorry, not 45 years ago, what was it, 1980, they were removed in sections 22 and 23 of the Education Act. We got them back after a fashion, uh, and um, that's an example of the messiness. It's not just a quick switch over. So we've had some gains. I think climate change has been very effectively put onto the agenda. The food is a major feature and factor in, in uh, creating climate change and also that food has got to be a factor for modifying climate change. Uh, we've got many people in this room who've contributed in serious ways to that. We've also done very well in building alliances. I think the center has been very good at trying to build uh, the, an old tradition of academia working with civil society. That's very important and very honorable, and I think to be, to be celebrated. Uh, but things I think we've not managed to do or scale up. Actually, if you look at the data, if you look at Mike Heesman's and my latest edition of Food Wars, came out last year, I mean, the data are terrible. Uh, it's, it's shocking. They're going in the wrong direction. We've had stacks and stacks of data of the need to change diets, the need to uh, change the food system, to decarbonize, to dehydrate, literally to remove water and think about water, to invest in ecosystems and to protect the infrastructure on which food systems work uh, and depend. And actually the destruction carries on. It's actually sober, very, very sober. Um, uh, one of my favorite reports at the moment, and Corinne, I think you like it too, is the metabolic report. Uh, anyone who's on my ex-students and present students emailing this, you'll have had it from me, uh, by a Dutch group called Metabolic, done for WWF. It's really good. If you, if, if you haven't, if you don't know that, get a look at it. If you just Google Metabolic and WWF, it'll come up. It's a really good systems analysis. Uh, I don't think we've been good on culture. We've not actually succeeded enough. The electronic media have run away. Social media, we think it's very good and we do Twitter and hashtags, but actually, if you like, the other side in public health is running away with us. They're winning, we're not. If you look at the hard data on big data, um, they've, they're using it better than we are in public health. We've not been good on tackling concentration in the food industry. The food system is getting highly concentrated. My standard example at the moment is um, in the European Union, there are 297,000 food manufacturing companies. 3,000 of those, that's 1%, account for 50% of all food manufacturing. It's highly concentrated. Um, that doesn't necessarily matter, uh, but it does matter when it comes to the rise and rise, and this we also haven't uh, succeeded, the rise and rise of uh, what Carlos Montero who Corinna has worked with in Brazil, calls ultra-processed foods. I think we've got the arguments on the agenda about sugar and salt, and there's been very effective campaigns, but actually the reality is still this avalanche of processed foods. I think we've not succeeded on the issue of food labor. Food is low-waged, consistently everywhere in the world. 500 million people working in the food system don't get a wage at all. Not necessarily a bad thing. Gardeners don't get paid. That's one of the joys of gardening. But um, uh, there's a lot of work in the food system which is unwaged. I think we've been bad on that. And that's rising up the agenda, certainly in Europe, on the issue of migration. Um, we've been weak 
on getting governments prepared to, to lead, actually. I think that is really, for me as a policy analyst, that's one of our real failures. We, we dent governments at times, but we haven't actually got a system shift. I think we had a moment after the banking crisis, 2007-8, I see Terry nodding, I think you and I agreed with that. Oh, well, we were both on the Chatham House uh, working party looking at the time, and suddenly when the banking crisis happened, wow, the British state, the G8s, the G20s, all focused like mad. It wasn't just the problem is Africa and we've just got to do a Bill Gates on Africa and everything will be okay. It's us, actually. Uh, it's us. We've got to do it. So, in summary, I think our success is actually patchy. It's patchy. We've done well for 40 years ago. We've got my friend Jeff Tanzi here who founded the journal Food Policy. You know, we met then when all of this was beginning, this new arguments about food policy. Uh, we've done well uh, in some respects. But have we really transformed the nature of food and capitalism? No. We've dented it and we've got some shifts but have we transformed it so that it's good to the environment and good to public health and feeding everyone decently? No. I think we have to solve it. I sat in my study and just thought, actually, that is my conclusion. I can't say otherwise because the data just point in that direction. But that is not to say that we immediately go and commit suicide and say there's no point, we've failed, we're all a waste of time. Actually, the very fact that we're doing what we're doing is putting it on the agenda. And anyone with any understanding of food history knows this is exactly what happened between 1820 and 1890. It takes a long time to get issues on the agenda. So I'm not someone who's depressed about this at all. Now, let's focus in on where were we 25 years ago. The ending of the Cold War, Thatcher-Reagan era, USSR crumbling, tomato ketchup, uh, designated as a vegetable by Ronald Reagan in American <laughs> Foods. You know, do you remember that, Phil? You know, astonishing. Uh, well, that wouldn't pass the laugh test now. Uh, but in the 1980s, everyone, I think, was very surprised. In the 1990s, I remember Aubrey Scheel uh, taking me to one side and saying to him, why are you going on about adulteration of food? What matters is coronary heart disease and strokes and diabetes all these issues, and I said, because I think the adulteration of food is actually what connects to people more. Uh, they should be concerned about heart disease, but they're actually being connected to the adulteration and are their babies' brains being fried by eating some pesticide residue or something. I mean, I'm being very crude. Uh, how can we connect that with the bigger picture on public health, it seemed to me, was what we had to do. Actually, the evidence about pesticides was that actually the big problem was in Brazil. If you looked at the ILO figures, uh, the pesticide poisonings were astronomic in countries, particularly Brazil, where there was complete misuse and poor health and safety and monitoring and so on. Uh, but basically, 25 years ago, the era of productionism was beginning, beginning to be questioned. The boydor and beverage argument that all we needed to do was produce more food, prices would come down, and more people would be fed and be very crude, but it's what we call the productionist model, productionist paradigm. That was beginning to be dented. The great Susan George, who some of us know, not the actress, but the much more important American uh, writer, had shown in, um, uh, shown in How the Other Half Die uh, that the workings of the World Bank were more important in shaping who got what food and where the money flows went than anything to do with social need. But nevertheless, productionism was being questioned 25 years ago. I can give you a chapter and verse in this. I've put lots of references. I won't bore you with it. What was breaking up in the productionist paradigm 25 years ago when we started this, I think were four big arguments. I don't know if David will agree with me on this. The first, I think, was the development agenda. The development agenda was beginning to recognize that the formal gap of 40 years ago between the rich world and the poor world was actually narrowing. Phil James was one of the architects of this sort of understanding of the rise of obesity and so on. Uh, 
um, uh, you know, the flip sides of the coin between the rich world and the poor world was narrowing in a way that we were uncertain and needed to understand. Anyone René Dumont, the great breaker, Castro, Fidel Castro, died two weeks ago. I mean, René Dumont uh, uh, left Cuba in disgust with Castro, quite rightly in my view, because here was a highly fertile country which he then encouraged to be put down for sugar for Russia. I mean, what sort of social development is that? The second undermining of the productionist paradigm was the diet and health arguments. I mean, here, we've got Phil, we've got Aileen, we've got other people who've been major players in this. I mean, those arguments about diet and food and the impact on non-communicable disease, what my friend Aubrey Sheehan remonstrated with me, not uh, 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 deviating from uh, in the 1980s, uh, they're right those arguments have actually got bedded down very well in the last 25 years. Yudkin's book on sugar, 1972. Aubrey and, and Helena, uh, his wife, uh, and their work on sugar was following on the traditions of older arguments about sugar. Uh, fi fiber, trowel and burkett and so on. The emergence of Western diseases as a radical critique of the Western food system was nothing new. It was already underway 25 years ago. The third area was the environment. And this was the new one. 25 years ago, the arguments about biodiversity, about agrochemicals, about oil, the oil dependency, the World Food Conference, the Club of Rome report, 1972 and so on, was encouraging big companies, Club of Rome, uh, to look for technical fixes, to try and get for more efficiency, to streamline output, to invest more with capital, to develop higher productivity. And actually, when we were uh, starting, the legacy of three really important reports, everyone today knows Brundtland's uh, um, uh, Commission on Environment and Development, but very few people remember the Brandt Report on International Development or the Olive Palmer Commission on Disarmament and Security. That trio of big reports was actually a very interesting framework of thinking that actually we've all inherited. Uh, the social inequalities is the fourth area, I think, which has really grown. I mean, that was what the Brandt Report was about. He said, basically, uh, we can't go on like this. This was in 1980. I mean, the inequalities have widened massively, although total wealth has grown as the way at the same time. This was the era of the Black Report, the denial that we could talk about food poverty in a rich country like Britain. Uh, we, had to talk, uh, we had to talk in public health about social gradients. You couldn't talk about class. The language was changed, you remember that. Uh, but the reality today, I think, is uh, uh, very different. Sorry, I should have done that. Okay, so where is food policy today? So let's jump forward to the present. I think the first thing is that the term is on the map, actually. It's one of the things. I mean, 25 years ago, 40 years ago, there was the journal that Jeff started, and that was it. I mean, I remember being really excited when a British government report put the term food policy in. Do you remember? You and I talked. I mean, it was astonishing. We thought, wow. You know, I mean, can you imagine what sad people we were uh, to get excited about those things? But actually what happened uh, was that the evidence on food safety, the crises of uh, the European food system on food safety, the mad cow disease, all of those things had led to a rethinking about the structure of the European food system and indeed the global food system and how it was working. Uh, but the reality, I think, is still messy. It's full of tensions. If we take a food systems approach, which progressive companies do and academics endlessly have or eventually have to take, we have to actually talk in interdisciplinary terms and to look at cross-level analyses. But I think, actually, if I'm really honest, I think one of the things we've failed to do is to inject systems thinking into what we do. Uh, 
Mike Rayner and Phil James and I the other day, we had a very interesting argument, actually, about systems thinking and single issue focus. And uh, uh, is it too difficult to think in terms of systems? You know, you drown in complexity. You can't deal with all the levers. Isn't it just better to go with one thing? You know, at one level, it's true. But the problem is one thing doesn't resolve the system. It can be accommodated and incorporated. So I think we have work to do on normalizing systems thinking. I think uh, food inequalities is our absolute running saw. It is our running saw globally in European terms, in British terms, in English terms in this rich city of London terms, whichever level you look at it. You know, but there we've done good work. You know, the Fabian Commission, Frank Field's report, we argue with him, but you know, this is, the fact that it is happening is really actually impressive, and it got leverage. The fact that we can argue, and there's a diversity of food poverty reports is astonishing. It actually says a lot about the British circumstance, I think, but similar sort of a uh, multiplicity of positions has emerged at the European level and the global level. But I think now we're entering a very different time with Brexit. Brexit in the European uh, uh, policy world is going to make inequalities harder. The anti-migrant feeling is making it worse. Trump, the rise of AFD in Germany and so on. This is very hard. Normalization of food banks is hard. The burgeoning food movement is critical. You, us, we. It's fantastic. Academics, civil society, commerce. The movement is internationalized. It's not, people always used to say in the 80s to me and my friends, what, why is it so this amazing movement in Britain? Well, it was actually because of Mrs. Thatcher. We couldn't do anything with the British government, so we talked at the European level. Um, but actually, it's global. You can go anywhere in the world, and maybe it's a different set of arguments. You know, Aileen, you and WHO, you've known that. Aileen was the head of nutrition in the European region. I mean, it's remarkable how that argument has spread, and the, the understanding has spread. The movement is international. But I think we have to conclude that the uh, state of official food policy is weak. There was a moment when I was very hopeful. I thought after the banking crisis and that sudden moment of engagement with the rich countries, our own in Britain particularly engaged, I thought we might get somewhere. But it was swept back very quickly, 2010. It was wiped away, as it does. One shouldn't be depressed about that. That happened. That's what history shows. One takes steps forward, you get blown back, new arguments come, people drop dead, things go on, you know? We're in one of those moments of going back. Uh, it's grown internationally, from the, multi, uh, the <coughs> Millennium Development Goals to the SDGs, 17 goals for the SDGs, 163 targets, 70 of them are food. Food is on the agenda at that global level. There's been institutional development. The UN Rapporteur on the Right to Food has been a magnificent change, but it hasn't altered the FAO. I mean, it's excellent, it's wonderful as a transformation, but it's been a voice, it's been an agency. We've got EFSA, the European Food Safety Authority. We've had the Food Standards Agency. Phil James was the architect, and Eric and I, and Mike Rayner wrote papers before that trying to help set it up. It's now a shadow of its <coughs> former self. Institutions can rise, but they can get weakened. So we're in that sort of moment. But we have big reports. This is where I speak to my fellow academics. It's really important. The academics, our job is to put these issues on the agenda, to lay out the data and say there has to be a policy <coughs> response to this. At the UK level, this is clearly very important. In the UK, we had, I think, the high point of the modern thinking was Food 2030 by DEFRA. But actually, in Scotland and Wales, it's taken a different uh, uh, position. The result of this I'm trying to convey, and forgive me if this is complex, is that we've got 
uh, a mix of some engagement, we should be very pleased, we should congratulate ourselves, some drift, some going backwards, some blank denial. Anyone following the appointments of the Trump administration, it's just blank denial. Anyone who believes in evidence-based policy needs to wake up. You know, there's policy with no evidence, okay? There's policy in search of evidence, there's policy <laughs> despite evidence. You know, if you read our books, we outline these sort of relationships. It's no good just to talk in terms of evidence-based policy. We've got to say different modes of relationship between evidence and policy. So why am I cheerful? <laughs> I'm looking at you through a fog. That's not why I'm cheerful. I think I'm cheerful because despite going backwards at the moment, we've got some legacies with us. I think big companies and little companies have bought into the sustainable consumption and production paradigm. Is the microphone just gone? The microphone just gone, Talvinda. Is it, can you hear me again? It's on again. It's on again. <laughs> Good. Uh, the sustainable consumption and production, I think, is a high tide mark. It's there. Big companies don't want to lose that, nor do small companies. The global food security discourse, I think, is really important, and I pay great tribute to my colleague Corinna on the Global Nutrition Report and the Globan Report now. Uh, keeping those reports out is so important. What you do is just so important. We have to support and aid and continue to do things like that. My colleague Pamela Mason came in there. She and I have just slaved away for two years writing an enormously boring book uh, on sustainable diets, which will be out next year, um, which you can all give to your dog for Christmas next year. Um, uh, you know, the, the evidence for the need for shift of consumption patterns is overwhelming. Luca Ruini is here from the architect of the Barilla uh, uh, double pyramid. I mean, this is, it just has to go on, Luca. This has to go on. But I've, I've said this to Luca, he can disagree with me. I don't think it's up to companies to do that. They're great to do it. It's governments have to set the frameworks. We have to have common frameworks. You know, I salute what you've done and other people have done. But it, we need frameworks, and that ultimately becomes government. Uh, the data are sobering. Yesterday's report on methane. Methane is 30 times more powerful than CO2 equivalent. Uh, but uh, food is central to that. We have to tackle it. Uh, that's it. <laughs> I hope that was all right. I was actually probably, no, I went wobbly about five times. I don't know if it looked like it. <laughs> Did you notice? Tim, thank you very much uh, indeed uh, for giving us that overview. And indeed, halfway through, I didn't know whether to be cheerful or whether to be so deeply depressed. Um, I don't know what you guys are thinking. Probably something similar. Um, but I think what you've left us with is a big agenda. Um, there's, there's a lot to do, um, but there's a lot to, lot to build on. Yeah. And I would, uh, Tim said in his, in his remarks, that uh, food policy is still, is still weak. But I really think uh, I, that we really do need to thank Tim again for the fact that if it hadn't been for Tim, it would be a lot weaker. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> 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 